You may not like that you're in rebellion. You may not enjoy the fact that you're in rebellion, but there's no denying that's where you're at. They didn't want to talk to him anymore. Why? They were filled with guilt and shame, but God still came to where they were. He spoke to them. He called them. He was not mad at them. He wanted to be reconciled to them. See, isn't it amazing when we do wrong, we assume we know what God's response is going to be. But God is coming to where we're at while we're in our sin. How many of you understand it is difficult, if not impossible, to enjoy sin when God shows up? So now, for those with your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 7, verse 24. Verse 24 says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Most people come to God in one of two ways. This is not comprehensive, but it is general. Most people come to God through one of two ways, either by a godly example or by a painful experience. How many of you came to Jesus by godly example? Let me see your hands. Hold it up. How many came by painful experience? You see what I'm saying? Difficulties in this way and in this light can be perceived as a gift from God that draws us towards him. Here's here's where we can split hairs a little bit. Some people like to blame God for all the bad that's happened in their life. How many has been guilty of doing that? Something bad happened in your life? Well, God, if you was any kind of God, you would Okay? And if we're not careful, we wind up blaming him for what he didn't cause. But we have this saving grace in Scripture that says... All things will work together for the good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. So it doesn't matter that bad stuff has happened to you. That is still eligible for God to do his thing and boom, make the curse a blessing. Does that make sense? So rather than blaming God for the bad things, we ought to be using the bad things as a springboard to launch into the deep of God's grace. Does that make sense? So whether you grew up in a godly home that did everything perfect and it was just a picture-perfect family, everything was great, if that happened to you, praise God for that. But most, I would dare say, say they didn't fall into that camp and they had it very rocky, very hard, very difficult with lots of collateral damage. And God's promise to you is that if you'll trust him in the midst of that, he'll make even what the enemy meant to destroy you, he'll flip it around and make it something that will prosper you moving forward. I've known of people that found themselves as being victims, victims of an accident, a a motorcycle accident, found themselves in jail or prison or arrested or all kinds of bad things that happened, and God took those situations and in and through them they found God. In that particular type of scenario, can't you see the hand of God? Not that he caused the bad things, but that he took the bad things that the devil was trying to destroy them with and wrenched it so that they could come to know Jesus. I need you to hear, though, that it is possible for us to become hardened against God when we find ourselves in rebellion. You want to know the funny thing about rebellion? Nobody needs to tell you that you're rebellious. When you're in rebellion, you know you're in rebellion. You may not like that you're in rebellion. You may not enjoy the fact that you're in rebellion, but there's no denying that's where you're at. 
So when you feel the, the presence of God and you begin to push it back or you, you begin to feel this, this urge just to weep and you suck back the tears or you, you feel this urge to, to confess your faults before the Lord and instead you pretend like they don't exist and put them behind your back, you know you're in rebellion. So I, 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 just, I just want to be clear, this is not, I'm not speaking this in such a way as to somehow soften the heart of the rebellion, because I've learned something about people. The very situations that can cause some people to soften, that exact situation in somebody else's life can cause them to become hardened. I think there's an Arab, uh, Arab proverb that says, the same sun that causes mutter, uh, butter to melt also causes clay to harden. You see what I'm saying? And that's why one size does not fit all. Listen, there, there's a, how many ever made this statement? Listen, the Lord's going to have to get them, and I don't think he's going to have access until they hit rock bottom. How many ever heard that before? I'm just waiting on them. As soon as they hit rock bottom, I'll call them, I'll text them, I'll reach out to them. But they're, they're so messed up, if I talk to them right now, they're not going to pay attention, so they've just got to hit rock bottom before I deal with them. I, I, I want to correct that theology for just a minute. Because sometimes it's the lack of input and the lack of empathy that comes from the people of God in their life that caused them to be hardened. We think that they need to be mashed and, 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 and brought low to, to where they'll receive. And sometimes it might just be that it was a kind word, a compliment, a pat on the back, an invitation to a meal. Any of these small things could have generated some, some goodwill on the inside of them. It's not for you and I to know what the right time or the right way to reach them is. Our job is to sling the seed. Our job is to sling the seed. It's their job to receive the seed or to reject the seed. Does that make sense? So throw out those invitations. Send those text messages. Fire off an email an IM, a DM, and all the other ways that we've got to get a hold of people now. Just, just tell them, hey, thinking about you today, praying for you, would love for you to come to church with me or to show up to these Dennis Rainier meetings the 24th through the 26th. Shameless plug. You see how I did that? That's pretty good, right? So be open to the fact that just because a hard time brought you to Jesus, that same hard time that somebody else is going through might be taking them away from him we're all guilty of this, but we like to view other people's lives through our lens. Because when I went through that, it took this, this, and this for God to get a hold of my life. So obviously, they're in the first stage of that, and it's going to take this, this, and this before God's going to be able to... It, we're not built... We are built equal, but we're not built identical. That's why we have different tastes. We have but to walk out to the parking lot and look at our rides or, or look across the room and see the different clothing that, that people are wearing to understand we are all built differently, equal but different. God uses broken things. I heard Rachel say that a couple of times today. He does use broken things. It takes broken soil to raise a crop, broken clouds to give us rain, broken grain to get bread, broken bread to give strength. It was a broken alabaster box that anointed Jesus and caused a sweet fragrance to fill the room. It was Peter who failed miserably and wept bitterly that God used and raised him up as a mighty man of God. Peter would have never been a mighty man of God if he had not messed up royally. God used the problem to promote him. Isn't it funny? We pray that God prevents us from running into problems. But sometimes God allows problems because it strips things off of our life so that we're exposed to him and not insulated to him. How many has ever used wire strippers? Yep. So what do you do? You, you, take the, you find the right gauge. And you pinch those pliers, and then you strip the sheath off. Notice it was only deep enough to cut the sheath because the point was to expose the copper. And this is what God allows problems to do in our lives. See, problems just keep caking on and caking on and caking on, and they insulate us to where we're not, we're not able to sense him, feel him, receive from him. 
So he'll bring a word or a person in due season like those strippers, and it pulls all that stuff off to expose us to the things of God. Does that make sense? Strippers, wire strippers. I can just see so much stuff. Get, wire strippers. They're sharp. And they cut. And if we're not careful, we'll be more upset about what God cut off of us than what he's trying to apply to us. In the midst of your worst nightmare, if you go back to that spot, I don't know how many times in deliverance I've taken somebody back where they were being abused or beaten or, or, or some other things that I won't go into the graphic nature, but I've told them, I said, listen, I need you to go back to that moment. They said, I don't want to go back to that moment. I said, I'm, I'm asking you to trust me. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to go back and relive that for just a minute. And when they're in that zone, I say, now hit the pause button and look around the room. How many ever thought you understood and thought you remembered accurately what happened until you went back and you found the video on your phone? And you hit the pause button and you zoom in and you zoom out. Oh, my goodness. Look who, I didn't know they came to the party. I didn't know they were there. I, sometimes it's that way with our life experience. And we blame God that he wasn't there and he, he didn't intervene. But yet if we go back and look, God's always in the shadows waiting on us to cry out to him. See, God so honors our jurisdiction in our own life that he will not force himself into our life. He has to be invited. I've used this illustration before, but in today's society, you've got to be even doubly careful that if one of you is outside getting your rear end handed to you in the parking lot because two or three guys are on top of you, if I just jumped in just because I thought you were in a bad spot and needed the help, chances are I can go to jail. That's just the way that the, the law is today. But if you're down on the ground and you're getting the, the sense knocked out of you, and I said, hey, you want some help? Please help. Now I'm authorized. And God has been looking for authorization into our life. We wonder why there's so many problems and so much stress and, and irritations and, and things that I have to go through. God allows the problems to come into our life in the hopes that we will, we will be in the midst of that and, and cry out and say, Lord, I need some help. Because when we don't think we need his help, we don't cry out to him. So problems can be a blessing from the Lord. Not that he caused them, but that he used them to get our attention on him. We've got to listen to his voice calling, saying, you want some help? You want me to jump in? Too often we're blaming God for not knowing our heart. Well, God knew what I wanted. He knew what I needed in that moment, and he didn't help. Listen, if we expect God to know what was in our heart, shouldn't he also know what was in our mouth? As a man thinketh on the inside, so is he. So what's on the inside is going to come out on the outside. And if what's coming out on the outside is blame, there's only blame coming out of our mouth because the blame was first in our heart. If we want the help of Jesus, we need to put his, his call, his name in our mouth and cry out to him for assistance. When Adam and Eve sinned, God went to where they were. And all of a sudden, they weren't comfortable. Have you noticed that when people are in sin, they're uncomfortable in church? Have you noticed that? I've lost track of how many people have come in and they kind of dig the worship, and they see people really singing and celebrating, which, by the way, when the TV went out, and Nicholas and I walked back in the back, I was showing him what to do when that, when that happens. And when we got that uh, configured, and we started to walk back out, he goes, listen to that. Because you don't hear it from sitting out there, but up here, your voices was as loud as the sound system. That, it was phenomenal. <laughs> But when people, I've seen them come in and they'll enjoy the worship and they'll enjoy stuff that's going on, but all of a sudden, you start invoking the name, the blood, the anointing, the word. 
And all of a sudden, people are squirming in their seats, and they're bowing over, and they're looking down, and they're looking at scrolling their phone. They're doing anything and everything they can until finally they get so irritated they have to leave. Why? Because people that are living in sin, willfully living in sin, do not like hanging out in the presence of God. Now, I know there's always going to be one or two that's going to try to prove me wrong. And you'll be squirming on the inside, looking all cool, calm, and collected on the outside. But let's just face it, where we're still uncomfortable. Does that make sense? They didn't want to see Jesus. They didn't want to talk to him anymore. Why? They were filled with guilt and shame. But God still came to where they were. He spoke to them. He called them. He was not mad at them. He wanted to be reconciled to them. See, isn't it amazing when we do wrong, we assume we know what God's response is going to be. (sighs) But God is coming to where we're at while we're in our sin. How many of you understand it is difficult, if not impossible, to enjoy sin when God shows up? Huh? But he's coming not to cause guilt and shame and embarrassment. He's coming to try to, hey, would you please stop doing that and be reconciled to me? Would you just stop what you're doing and come home? It's kind of like parents running after runaway children. It's just the truth. Kids think they've had it and they know better and they're going to go do what they want to do. And the parents are pleading with them to come home. Why? Why? Because they know that they will be watched over, protected, nourished, fed, watered, and clothed. Some of you sitting in the room right now might still think that God is angry at you. He's not angry at you. We're still living in the age of grace. I believe that it's on its way down. We're we're about to see the end of this come real quick. But right now, at this moment, we're still in the age of grace. He's not mad at you. He's trying to reconcile with you. So while you find yourself in a broken state, if you'll listen, you'll hear the voice of the Lord calling your name. If you find yourself in desperate desperate trouble, you got yourself into, you can still count on God to be there for you. How, you say? Just respond. Respond to his invitation in repentance and faith. Repentance means turning away from the thing that separated you. Faith is turning towards God. I want you to hear that God will always respond to the cry of repentance and faith, no matter how desperate the situation, no matter how hopeless, no matter how helpless, God is there. In Mark 7, 24, says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know it, but he could not keep his presence a secret. So what, what's happening here? Jesus is attempting to get away. He's attempting to find a little respite. He's trying to find some rest from the busyness of ministry. He's worn slick out. So he's trying to find a siesta. So many times he would do this by trying to hang out with his disciples and friends. Tyre was a Gentile territory so going to tire would get him away from the jewish crowds it would get him out of the limelight for a while it was it was intentional that he went to gentile territory this should have been a quiet safe place for him this should have been a place of refuge for him but even there there was someone crying out for help Have you heard this story about the insurance agent who got a phone call from an excited woman? She said, I want to insure my house. Can I do it by phone? The man said, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd have to see it first. And the woman shouted at him, then you better hurry because the place is on fire right now. I can tell some of you don't carry insurance or you'd understand that. The point is Jesus never turned down anyone that was in need or seeking his help. It didn't matter if their house was on fire or not. He was there. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. If Jesus himself says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, then why do other people always say that it's so hard to serve Jesus? 
Now watch this. If Jesus is over here and the world is over there and you're wanting to be saved from all that's pulling you to destruction, if you say yes to Jesus, then he pulls you this way. Here's the problem. We want the benefits of heaven, but we want the thrill of the world. So those that say his burden, his yoke is not easy and his burden is not light is because they're not coming out of darkness into light. They have the knowledge of the light, but they're going to the world and they're, they're going against the gravitational force of God's love trying to draw them so they find it difficult to serve him because they're running from him. So anybody who says, it's not, it's not easy, it's, not, it's, it's so difficult to serve Jesus. I don't serve Jesus with my own power. I serve Jesus with, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what enables me to do what I can't do by on my own. That's why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because the closer I get to him, the more junk falls off. The closer I get to him, the bigger stripper pliers that he uses to pull even more junk off my life until I'm just stripped nothing but just me and him. Matthew 20, verse 28, For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to, not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life a ransom for many. Have you noticed that a lot of people, when they come to the church, they don't come to serve, they come to be served. They come to get, not to give. There's got to be both, or this boat's going to be lopsided and capsized. Does that make sense? Christ can always be found in a crisis. Hear that. Christ can always be found in a crisis. So come to him just as you are with your needs, with repentance and faith. Mark 7, 25. As soon as he heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. Do you understand how desperate a woman has to be to run to some guy's feet and fall to the ground? Most of us, when we're in need, we still have to come dignified. Look, I, I, I could use a little bit of help. And then we give, we give off the air that if you help me, it's to your benefit that you help me. We never want to see ourselves beholden to somebody else, but the truth is that's how we get through life. I'm helping one, but I'm receiving help from another, and this, it's, it's just constant. That's, that's how we keep moving in life. You're never going to be in a position where you don't need the assistance of somebody else. So this woman's heart is in turmoil over her daughter who's demon-possessed. She's a descendant of the Canaanites. They occupied the land that God had given to Israel. Sound familiar? They were supposed to have been destroyed and driven out because of their corrupt and lewd and wicked practices. And it's this woman who's coming to Jesus. Why? She heard he was there. You want to know why a lot of people haven't found the answers in Jesus? Because you haven't been where you're supposed to be. That's why they haven't heard. That's why they don't know that there's a way out. There's an answer to their situation. Because you avoided a divine appointment because you were too tired, too lazy, too busy, too angry, too whatever. You missed the divine appointment and connection that God, through the Holy Spirit, wanted you present. So when they said, I really need some help, here it is. Does that make sense? You know, it's very possible that this young girl was demonically controlled as a result of demonic worship that her mother could have encouraged her to do. You know how many parents live like hellions and it didn't appear as though their life really reflected that they did. But they set this example for their kids. So their kids begin to fall in line to the 
the path set by the parents. Only the kids are catching all the flack. The kids are reaping not only their stuff, but their parents' stuff. Things aren't always the way they appear. So this woman who's in a land that was given to the children of Israel hears that a Jew has arrived that has the answer to her issues. And she's so desperate, she fell at his feet to petition him for help with her daughter. Can you imagine what must have gone through the heart of that mother when there was no witch doctor, no pharmacy, no counselor, no friendship, no pill, no activity. Nothing can help her kid. She's exhausted all avenues. Nothing has worked. This mother is not only desperate, but she's scared. I remember when Lexi was a baby, she got bit by a scorpion. I had never been bitten by a scorpion, so I had no frame of reference. But Rachel grew up in Arizona. If you get bitten by a scorpion in Arizona, it can kill you. So as soon as she realized, hey, that scorpion just bit our kid, I killed the scorpion, and she's freaking out, which caused me to freak out. So I scarfed up Lexi, threw him in the car, and ran to an ER. Went in there saying, I need help, and I need it now. Fill out this paperwork. You don't understand. I ain't got time for paperwork. My daughter's been bit. Bit by what? A scorpion. And? Can't that kill her? Not in Oklahoma. But desperation will cause you to do what you wouldn't ordinarily do. It'll cause you to run red lights and avoid, avoid the police and, and, and jump across the desk and, you know, at, at people and demand help and, and assistance. Why? Because when you feel like you're out of control and you have not what it takes in order to save your kid, you'll do what you wouldn't ordinarily do. And this is what this woman has done. She fell at the, at the feet of a Jewish teacher. And he responded by saying, don't you know that I'm here for the Jews? Now, what was he saying? Jesus understood his assignment. His assignment was to so teach and release what he had to the Jews that the Jews would wind up being the ones that taught the world about who he was. But the plan didn't work out that way. So before it went into second gear and another level of grace that opened up for the rest of us, this woman is jumping the line. Remember when, when Jesus was told by his mom, said, hey, they've run out of wine. He said, woman, it's not yet my time. She ignored him, looked at the people, said, just do what he says do. And she left. She put a demand before his time. Y'all don't hear anything I'm saying. See, some of you can think you're, you're so late, and if Jesus did I mean, it, it's too far gone. And it really, it's not too far gone. It's not even time yet. You're, you're a little ahead of the curve. But if your faith is there, God has proven he'll violate his own rules in order to take care of you. It's just like wanting the cookies to be baked in the oven, and the timer still got three minutes. So you ding. God is so good that when you force that timer, the cookies are done. What happens when your kids are beyond your help? Bring them to Jesus. What happens when your kids have problems bigger than you know how to fix? Bring them to Jesus. I can just hear some of you, I've tried. I've tried to bring them to Jesus, and I've tried to bring them to church. They won't go. Then bring Jesus to them. Bring Jesus to them. How do you do that? Sometimes 
you set them up. I'm just going to tell you some tricks real quick. Sometimes you set them up. Sometimes you get them at a job interview with somebody who you know loves Jesus. Sometimes you get them to show up at lunch when you're eating with somebody that loves Jesus. It's not the fact you don't love Jesus, but they've already got to discount everything you're going to say, right? So you get them connected to somebody that they don't know. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes, especially with your own kids, you need somebody a bit more bold and brash than you are. You need somebody who's more concerned about them getting the truth than getting goosebumps. We may never, and I'm not cursing what we're doing. I'm just saying, in the grand scheme of things, we may never be a church of 5,000. And I'm okay with that either way, whether we are or we're not. But I won't compromise the message to get the numbers. The truth is the truth. People have to hear it. Because if I don't release the truth to them, I'll be met with a new truth when I stand before God. You catch what I'm saying? So I'm going to see to it that the responsibility of your eternity lays squarely upon your shoulders, not mine. And I do that by seeing to it that you have the truth. And you say, thank you, Chris. It, th- this, th- that may seem a little heavy. It, here's, here's my problem. I don't think the church sees the gospel as heavy enough. I think we've gotten so used to tipping ministers, tipping the plate, uh, you know, getting, getting people to, to, to be amazed that we would show up and help out with this, that, or the other, and they miss the point. We're, we're not doing it for recognition. We're not doing it so we'll get a slap on the back. We're doing it because the gospel will not be promoted without these things, these things functioning and happening. The goal is to not be seen of men. The goal is to have men see Jesus. Can you imagine a young couple out of wedlock had a child way too young? The child is given up for adoption. The young mom was just ill equipped to handle the baby at that time. And with the support of her family, they signed the papers to relinquish all rights unbeknownst to the father. And so for years and years and years, the father is fighting the legal system and all the privacy laws trying to locate his baby. And all the while, this baby is growing up believing that they were rejected, unloved, unwanted, unneeded, Worthless, not knowing that that daddy is desperately trying to find that child. So one day, when the child is 50, 60 years old, and the dad is quite aged. He finally finds him. So he initiates the phone call. I'd love to meet you. And the child angry because of their perception says some unthinkable things and slams the phone wanting nothing to do with the father who for most of his life has done nothing but search for the child. While that illustration is not perfect, I hope it gives some gravity to how other people are that we come in contact with that are angry because they don't believe that God wants them, loves them, cares about them, 
or is mindful of their situation. And here you and I house him and we don't share him with them so that they can know how loved and wanted and because God chose you and I to be the faithful delivery person to get him connected to them. That's why some people find themselves on their deathbed angry at God because their whole life they've imagined that he had abandoned them, didn't want them, left them to people that were less than kind and generous towards them, and they blame all this on a God that they never knew. Why didn't they ever know that who God was? Because you and I didn't share him with them. That's how heavy this thing called sharing the gospel and ministry is. If you're doing ministry right, it's taxing. That's why Jesus had to get away. That's why he went to the land of the Gentiles. Why? To get a and b and to be away from those needy Jews for a minute because it was taxing. But he walked away from needy Jews and found a needy Syrophoenician woman. Because needs are real across ethnicity and across geography. And that's why it doesn't matter if you're trying to sleep, trying to rest, trying to have a vacation, trying to get your work done. There's always going to be needs that you and I are equipped to handle. We've just got to be willing to do so. So this woman came in desperation. Because she was desperate, she found herself humble. And not only was she humble, but she was persistent. She wanted help. She would beg. She would plead. There was no room for pride. There's going to come a time in your life that there's a need in your life, a desperate need that you're going to realize that Jesus is the only answer there is. And it's in times like this that the most important thing in the world is for us to be able to talk to God and have our prayers answered. That's why you always need to be on good speaking terms with God. Because there's always going to be a time that you're going to need him. I don't know how many times people have come to me to try to tell me about their problems, their needs, their situations that's going on. And a great question to ask them and to ask them to reflect on is this. Are you in a position to be blessed? And they say, what are you talking about? Are you in living in willful disobedience? Because if you're living in willful disobedience and you're expecting God to bless your life. You're asking God to violate his word. So if God blesses us in the middle of disobedience, it's teaching us that disobedience is favored. So God can't bless us in the midst of disobedience or it sends the wrong message. It's amazing how many times that we as believers put something ahead of God in our priorities and then, God, and then ask God to bless the idol that we've been leaving him for. Our career, material possessions, sports, recreation, even kids. Don't ever use your children to be a scapegoat for why you're not hanging with God. God's not going to bless disobedience. Remember the story of the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? What did he tell her? Go and sin no more. Go and and sin no more. There is, there is an act of obedience that we have to have in order to keep the blessing of God upon our life. So we've got to come to him humbly, admit that we need help, take steps of repentance. I'm going to read you an illustration, then I'm going to pray for you. During World War I, there was a British commander that was preparing to lead his soldiers back to battle. They'd been on furlough. It was cold, rainy, and muddy. Their shoulders sagged because they knew what lay ahead of them. More mud, lots of blood, possible death. Nobody talked. Nobody sang. It was a heavy time. 
As they marched along, the commander looked into a bombed out church and he saw the figure of Jesus in the church. And at that moment, something happened to the commander. He remembered the one who suffered and died and rose again. And a sense of victory and triumph rose up on the inside of him. And as the troops marched by, he shouted out, Eyes right, march! Every eye turned to the right. And as the soldiers marched by, they too saw Jesus in the burned out church. Something happened to them in that moment. They took courage. They straightened their shoulders. And they went forward. I pray that when people look in this house, and no excuses, that they see Jesus, that they sense victory in the midst of trouble, and they know from a walk with you and I that Jesus alone makes the difference. So whether you're a mom who doesn't know what to do with her children or whether you're just somebody who's in the throes of the biggest battle of your life, the need is great. The situation is desperate. And Jesus is simply waiting on us to respond to his voice calling our name. He's not calling us to beat us up and to tell us how bad we've been. He's calling to us to reconcile us back to him. We've got to stop running from God and start running to him. And if we've preached a gospel that causes people to run from him, we're preaching the wrong gospel. If you've caught this stream today, I pray you heard something that blessed you, encouraged you, uplifted you in some way. If you're looking for a church home, we're certainly looking to grow the family of God. We'd love to see you at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. We meet Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m., Thursday evenings at 645. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.